Mr. McCoy here with part 20 of Escape from Mr. Limoncello's library. As you recall, Kyle froze. This is it. He went to the wall with the list of library cards. What would happen if we played first letters with these book titles? Okay, said Miguel, moving to a clean space on the wall. Here are the first letters of all the titles. It still makes no sense, said Akima. Wait a second, said Sierra. If the title starts with an article, drop that word and use the letter from the second word. Got it, said Miguel. I-N-O-N-S-E-T-H-E-W-A-Y-O-U-T W-A-S-A-W, question mark, question mark, I-N. Okay, said Akima, it's making some sense. She went to the board and broke Miguel's string of letters into words. I slash N-O-N slash S-E-T slash H-E slash W-A-Y slash O-U-T slash W A S slash A slash W question mark question mark slash I N. Hang on, said Kyle. It could be in on set the way out was a W question mark question mark in. What's in on set? said Akima. Wait. Look, said Miguel, the books on the second and third library cards actually start with numbers. Kyle grabbed a marker. In 1968, the way out was a W question mark question mark in. Hang on, said Haley. You know all those questions in the trivia contest, Friday? I did so badly. I googled a bunch of them later that night. They were all from 1968. You guys, said Sierra, I did some research too. Mr. Limoncello was born in 1956. That means he turned 12 in 1968. Okay, said Akima, is this something besides a fun fact to know and tell? You bet it is, said Kyle. 1968 is key, and we don't need Charles's library card to finish this phrase. He went to the whiteboard. In 1968, the way out was a way in. So what happened in 1968, said Haley. Was that when Charles and the Chocolate Factory came out, asked Miguel. No, said Sierra, that was 1964. So what's up with the candy clue from the art and artifacts room? We messed up, said Akima. We need to go back and find a new rhyme for Andy. Really? said Haley. I thought we got kicked out for cheating. Another long story, said Miguel. For later, said Kyle. Right now, we need to be on the third floor. Back in the Arden Artifacts room, Kyle felt confident they were pretty close to figuring out, well, whatever it was they were supposed to be figuring out. How it could help them escape from the library was still anybody's guess. It's 1044, said Akima. The last clue should pop up on the Wonder Dome in 16 minutes. Okay, you guys, said Kyle. Spread out. We need a new rhyme for Andy. This model of the bank building came in handy, added Miguel. The Dandy Bandits, shouted Akima once again, studying the display of hats. Yes, said Haley, pulling off her shoes so she could show everybody her clue card. Bandits. I found this in the 300's room. That's the room Clue we're waiting for, said Kyle, because the Dewey Decimal number for true crime always starts with the number three, said Miguel. When we find that book, it'll tell us how and where the bandits crawled in in 1968. Listen to this, you guys, said Akima. She read a placard in the display case. This plaid fedora from 1968 was worn by bank robber Leopold Loblaw, one of the notorious dandy bandits. Loblolly, Miguel shouted. The smell-o-vision clue, said Kyle. That's why everything kept smelling like pine trees. 
Loblolly was one of the pine trees in the answer Mr. Limoncello gave you guys, said Haley. Whoop, 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 said Mr. Limoncello as banana shoes squeaking, he stepped into the room. Well done, Miss Daly and Miss Hughes. See, said Akima, I was right the first time we came in here. I said dandy and everybody else said no candy. Willy Wonka. Yes, it's all coming back to me, said Mr. Limoncello. 1968, I was pondering an idea for a game at the old public library. And, said Kyle, you were so totally focused you didn't hear the police sirens screaming past the library as they raced to the Gold Leaf Bank. The blackbird was from Alexandriaville, said Sierra. The police siren wail was from that day. Miguel finished that thought when the dandy bandits tried to crawl into the bank. My goodness, said Mr. Limoncello, how could you kids know all that? From the game clues, said Kyle, and from the story Dr. Zinchenko told us on Friday night when somebody asked her why a library building needed a bank vault door. She was already feeding us clues, said Akima. The time is now 11 a.m., announced the ceiling lady. This game will end in one hour. Come on, said Kyle, heading for the door. It's the 11th hour. We need to go check out the Wonder Dome again. They raced to the balcony. There it is, said Sierra. 364.1092, shouted Miguel. Woohoo! cried Akima. We're going to win. You think it's going to be that simple? Are they going to win that easily? Share what you think with your fellow listener. On the first floor, Charles sat at long last video chatting with his uncle, James Willoughby III, the Librarian of Congress, who had finally shown up for the Ask an Expert call. Sorry for the delay, Charles. That's okay, Uncle Jimmy, Charles said, straining to smile and not scream. The time is now 11 a.m., announced the annoyingly placid lady in the ceiling. This game will end in one hour. Charles had to hustle. Sir, I know you're an important, very busy man, so I have just one quick question. If I were a book on true crimes in the state of Ohio, where would you shelve me? Library of Congress classification? No, sir. Dewey Decimal. Ah, easy. 364.1. What comes after the one will depend, of course, on how many books a library... Charles didn't stick around to hear the rest of his uncle's answer. He took off running for the closest spiral staircase up to the second floor. As he ascended the steps two at a time, he saw Kyle Keeley and his entire entourage running down a staircase from the third floor. Charles reached the second floor balcony first. He darted around the bend, past the door to the 500's room, the 400's. Keeley and his crew were coming from the opposite direction. Charles reached the door to the 300's room before they did. He swiped his library card, yanked on the handle, and dashed into the room. He scanned the shelves and headed to his right. He heard Keeley enter the room. Glancing over his shoulder, Charles saw Keeley go left. Charles dashed up an aisle between bookcases. He read the number at the end of each of the shelves. 310, 320, 330, one of those robots with the book baskets came rumbling across his path, but Charles was able to dodge it. 340, 350, Keeley's footsteps pounded up the passageway on the other side of the shelving units to his left. In the middle of the 300's room, they entered an open space with a judge's bench and witness box. Charles was getting closer to the true crime section, but so was Kyle. Charles saw Keeley read something off his palm. He had the whole call number. It was time to change tactics. Charles hung back and let Keeley take the lead. Kyle rushed toward a bookcase. Charles sprinted after him. Got it! Kyle shouted as he reached for a book on the shelf. But before he could completely pull it out, Charles grabbed hold of the book, too. They both yanked it off the shelf. Kyle had the spine, Charles had a hold of the top. They tugged it back and forth. While they wrestled with the book, Keeley's teammates caught up to them. 
Careful, Kyle, cried C.R. Russell. Don't hurt the book. Charles grinned. Keeley, the sentimental sap, was listening to the silly, bookish girl and easing up on his grip, giving Charles his chance. What do you think's going to happen now? Share with your fellow listener. He body-checked Keeley, slammed into him with his shoulder, sent him flying, the book tumbling. Charles snatched it off the floor. He had the book. He quickly flipped through the table of contents, saw chapter 11 was about a robbery at the Gold Leaf Bank in Alexandriaville. He knew he'd won the game. Charles used his free hand to slap an L on his forehead. Loser, he sneered at Keeley. The tiger roared. The whistle blew, and Mr. Limoncello entered the room accompanied by Clarence Clement and what looked like a rare Bengal tiger. Mr. Chillington? Charles smiled. He knew Mr. Limoncello was about to congratulate him for defying the odds and winning the game. He had single-handedly defeated Kyle Keeley's entire team. Yes, Mr. Limoncello? Do you remember Dr. Zinchenko's number one rule? You bet, sir. No food or drink except in the Book Nook Cafe. No, said Mr. Limoncello, touching the tip of his nose and making a buzzer noise. Dr. Z, tell him what he should have said. Dr. Zinchenko's voice purred out of the ceiling speakers. Be gentle with each other and most especially the library's books and exhibits. I know, said Charles. That's why I had to stop Kyle Keeley. He was ready to rip the cover off this poor book. Heck, sir, everybody at school knows that Kyle Keeley is a maniac. He'll do anything to win a game. Mr. Limoncello turned to Keeley. Is that true, Kyle? Would you actually destroy property if it stood between you and your prize? Uh, well, uh, sir, Keeley was stammering. The fool didn't know how to lie. Charles quickly opened the book to chapter 11 and slipped in his library card to bookmark the location. You should ask Keeley about the window he broke, sir. Mr. Limoncello turned to face Charles again. The window? Yes, sir. The whole school heard about it. See, Kyle Keeley and his two brothers were playing some sort of wild scavenger hunt game, and... Mr. Limoncello pointed at the book. That's clever. You use your library card as a bookmark? Yes, sir, I sure do, said Kyle, turning on the charm. Of course, I can't take full credit for such a clever idea. On Friday night, I saw Sierra Russell doing it, and you told Andrew Peckleman to borrow her car. Charles blinked uh, several times. I, I, I beg your pardon. You broke Dr. Zinchenko's number one rule. You were not gentle with your teammate, Andrew. In fact, you bullied him into stealing Miss Russell's library card, which you knew she always used as a bookmark. Uh, no, sir, I did not. <laughs> yes, Charles, you did. Mr. Limoncello touched his right ear. In fact, Dr. Zinchenko has spent the past few hours combing through security tapes. And guess what she just found. I'll bet you you can guess what Dr. Zinchenko found. Share with your fellow listener. And now, a couple minutes more of Escape from Mr. Limoncello's Library. Charles heard his own voice ringing out of the ceiling speakers. Have you noticed what Sierra Russell uses for a bookmark? No, that was Andrew, said Mr. Limoncello. This is you again. Her library card, which of course doubles as a key card for meeting room B. Find a way to borrow it. You told Andrew to steal Sierra's library card. How could you record that, said Charles. I was whispering. And I have very good microphones. You're done, Charles. Dr. Zinchenko, tell our departing guest what he has just won. Absolutely nothing, said the voice of the Russian librarian. But please, Dr. L, tell Charles the correct answer to the final pictogram. Ah, yes, Mr. Limoncello reached into his back pocket, pulled out a 4x4 card, and showed it to Charles. 
Charles stood there fuming. Anyone care to help Charles out? Hmm, said Kyle. Is it six eat? You are very close, said Mr. Limoncello. There was a pause, and then Haley laughed. Did it come after the football player? Yeah, said Charles. So? Andrew was right all along, said Haley. The football player clue wasn't past. It was 19. Mr. Limoncello shifted into his game show voice. So, Haley Daly, would you care to solve the puzzle? Sure. We'll find out what happens as escape from Mr. Limoncello's library continues.